beautiful being here and uh, situated in a very still, quiet room and looking out over the Portuguese countryside uh, on a quiet, sunny afternoon. So it's beautiful, beautiful for me to see that. And I'm really grateful to be part of this because uh, the new beginning is, is an invitation to all of us to leave the past behind and to look completely anew on everything and everyone. And it's just beautiful. I'm just putting the gallery view on so I can see all your smiling faces again. It always inspires me. Only one thing more beautiful than the Portuguese countryside is looking down at my screen and seeing all your faces. Uh, so, so joyful, so, so happy. We're so joined in this. Well, today I thought uh, I was glancing through some of the questions that had been written in and also I thought I would uh, try to give a context for this new beginning because it helps to be aware of what's really going on. Because most of us, whenever we use a word, uh, we always have some kind of a context or a reference point or a connotation for that word. And even if you look at the word beginning, uh, there's there's some meanings and connotations that go with the word beginning, certainly with new beginning as well. And what I would say is all of our concepts that are based on the past are based on time and based on our reference points in time. So when we think of beginning, we juxtapose that in the world of opposites to beginnings and endings. And beginnings come first and endings come last. But the new beginning that we're talking about is not really a beginning in time. We're so accustomed to thinking about everything in terms of time. So sometimes if you would think new beginning means new start or fresh start, that still could be uh, a point in time. And this new beginning is actually transcending time. It's actually our desire and our willingness to transcend time entirely and remember eternity. So Jesus, 2,000 years ago, he said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the ending. And he was talking about that in the sense that that's saying that, that the presence of the Christ mind, the presence of the, the Christ the pure spirit that's a pure creation of God is literally beyond time. And therefore, what we would say is a new beginning in terms of the Course of Miracles is a complete letting go of all concepts of time, including our, our meanings we've given to beginnings and endings. Uh, even coming here to Portugal, Lisa was hearing it's the, it's the last chapter, but but first and last and beginning and ending in terms of time, uh, in the end doesn't really have any meaning because there are no beginnings and endings in eternity. So we're just opening our hearts up to a new experience. I see what this experience is. It's an experience of, of our abstraction. Uh, everything in this world of time and space is about specifics. And our mind has become comfortable with specifics. It's become very familiar with specifics. You might say even it's become addicted to specifics. And now it considers the specifics, for example, birth and biological life, it considers those specifics as life itself because it's for God, it's divine abstraction as pure love and light, a pure being created by God. And so now it's all wrapped up into the specifics and it needs to be loosened from the specifics. So that's really what our new beginning is about. It's about training our mind to loosen from its 
belief in, reliance on, dependency on, and addiction to specifics. We need to come back to the remembrance of God, which is remembering our abstraction. So really that's what our new beginning is about. It's, it's an, a willingness, a desire, a determination to remember God or remember abstraction. So I have been looking through some of the questions uh, that were written in and um, there's some long ones and some short ones, but I would just, I thought I would just pick one uh, and just make a comment on it, and then I will look at some of the others and, and go into more details uh, from our section, uh, The New Beginning, Chapter 30, and also uh, from other parts of the course as, as needed. But um, there's basically prayers. These, you've been offering the prayers of your heart, and basically for your heart to, to break wide open, to really come into a deeper experience that, that transcends the, the concepts. I see Adriano from over in Germany, I see that he has a short question, but I thought I would make a comment on that from the same context that I'm talking about. Uh, Adriano's question was, uh, hi David, I have a question. Can you talk about fidelity? specifically sexual fidelity. So here's one of these topics that are, are pretty common and, and people have a lot of questions about this in terms of their daily lives and, and uh, this is a, a, a big topic and a big issue in um, sexual relationships, of fidelity. But I would say that uh, it can be a springboard for us in to go deeper inward into the new beginning. We can take any topic, any topic you can think of, and we can take it much deeper, and we can find out what is really there underneath that topic. What is it that we really need to accept? What is it we really need to hear? What is it we really need to learn? And I would say initially, Fidelity, if you look at it just in the terms of uh, sexual relationships, it's, it's very much uh, tied into monogamy and having uh, one uh, sexual partner. But if you look at it a little deeper, you can see that there's actually a commitment required in that kind of situation. In other words, to maintain fidelity in, the, in those terms would require a commitment. And what about commitment? We know that commitment fits into this picture somewhere. We have to be shown where it fits. And basically, when the mind falls asleep and forgets its source and forgets its oneness, then it, it believes in fragmentation. And it has just uh, gone into an experience that you could call hell because it's division, it's multiplicity, it's complexity, it's chaos. Uh, it's, it's destruction, it's pain, it's, it's duality. Uh, that belief in separation is, is the attempt at the impossible, and hell in reality uh, is impossible because God is real and only that which is real comes from God. And Christ and Spirit is real, but only that which comes from God is real. But in terms of this world, Commitment is required because you have to begin to commit to a change of purpose in the mind. You have to shift the purpose from a purpose of hatred to a purpose of love and forgiveness. And that's a big shift when the world was made in hatred and you have to pull your mind completely away from that hatred and that division and that conflict and open it only to the experience of wholeness and completion and love and joy and happiness. That's a big turnaround from separation back to wholeness. So it will require a commitment and actually it takes a commitment in terms of your mind training. That's what the commitment's going to be. You're going to have to have a discipline and a strong commitment in terms of your mind training to fully 
dive into this new beginning, to fully experience the full effects of the new beginning, not a time and space beginning, but the new beginning in terms of turning an upside down thought system that is based on fear and guilt, turning it right side up to the light so that what remains is, is a reflection of love, which is what forgiveness is. It's just a pure, beautiful reflection of love. And that's going to take a commitment. In terms of fidelity, what Adriano is asking about is, is that that's a commitment as well. And all commitments in this world, including sexual fidelity, are temporary commitments because they are the Holy Spirit using the, what the ego made. The ego made up the bodies, it made up the world, it made up time and space, and now the Holy Spirit uses what the ego made to bring the mind back towards that wholeness and completion. And, and fidelity is, is basically a, a commitment in terms of um, uh, being with one partner, uh, maintaining the f sexual fidelity, and that's just a uh, a temporary mind training device that the Holy Spirit is using to help strengthen this experience of commitment. Because when you believe in the ego, you believe in that which is very uh, impulsive, it's, it's wild, it, it, it doesn't even know what commitment is. The, the ego is, is like a wild child that uh, is a total, denial of God and love, and it, it doesn't know what consistency is, it doesn't know what honesty is, it doesn't know what commitment is, and it certainly doesn't see any need for commitment, uh, because it's total impulsivity is what it is, pure impulsivity in a, in a very uh, dark kind of way. And so that would be the meaning, that would be the helpful aspect of sexual fidelity, would be a mind training exercise to start to strengthen your belief and awareness into commitment. And, and again, it's just a temporary device that will, will go much higher because in the end, you're gonna to have to use that commitment toward the atonement, which is the correction, which is the correction for the ego, and that's going to help you escape from time and space. It's that important that you have to learn to develop commitment so that you can then aim it and use it for the atonement, to accept the correction for, your, for the error in your mind. And, and, and atonement, again, is, is the first miracle and the last miracle and all the miracles in between. It's the, it's the correction for all of the ego, and therefore it's the correction for the Big Bang and for all of time and space. So it's very important that you develop that sense of commitment. Adriano asked specifically about fidelity, uh, specifically in, in sexual fidelity, but if you had a yoga routine, uh, you could develop fidelity in there. If you have exercise routines or diet routines, maybe you've gone through a period of being vegetarian or macrobiotics or uh, uh, you've had various diets that you've practiced. Those are all opportunities to strengthen commitment because any of those things, even, even learning a language takes a, a pretty strong level of commitment. And so even learning a language could be a temporary device where you're developing this commitment. You see, it, it, it can relate to sexuality and partnership, but it also can relate to a number of aspects in time and space. The key point is the Holy Spirit needs to develop commitment, the belief in commitment, because the ego doesn't even know what commitment is. So that's Adriano's question, and that's kind of putting it in a higher, uh, higher context. And then um, I see Stephanie, you've written in too, you were talking about uh, accidentally seemingly coming across a, a speaker that, by Francis and, and uh, basically seeing that happiness is 
is uh, it's a state of mind. Happiness requires uh, a commitment, but it's 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 a state of mind, and it's it's not it's it's, it's synonymous with peace and joy and light, uh, lightheartedness, love, and yet. That's another good example where when you begin to look at the idea of, of happiness and overcoming a sense of anxiety or overcoming a sense of um, loneliness or uh, feeling separate, then you start to open up to happiness. You start to realize that happiness cannot really be for the things of this world. You know, for most people, they would tell you, like, if you want to be happy, you have to uh, have certain things of this world. Uh, you have to have things work out. And you went through a number of those where you were starting to realize that, that it wasn't related to, to job or family or friends or those specific things. Actually, the happiness, it, it's within you. And it's not related to any of those specific things at all. And again, that relates to what we were talking about, about new beginnings, because in this world of time and space and scripts and stories, there seems to be many beginnings and many endings. And um, when people go through a divorce or the loss of a loved one or uh, losing their job or, or their child uh, going away to college and moving away, there seems to be many beginnings and endings in this world. But what we're learning is our happiness cannot really be dependent on any of those things. And that brings up the big uh, inward draw. It's like uh, it can be very intense to start to realize that the things of the world don't make you happy and neither do they take away your happiness in their absence. It's this whole belief, there must be a belief system that's underneath that has to get raised up to awareness and exposed because it's not the things of the world that are going to make us happy or take away our happiness. And that's a huge discovery. It, in fact, um, it goes so much against the grain, it goes so much against all of our cultural learning all of our cultural conditioning, all of our societal conditioning, it goes completely against everything we've ever been taught in this world. Because the world is saying, yeah, just uh, get certain things in your life, uh, whether it's money or possessions or relationships or education or skills or abilities, something. Uh, if you get the right things and you get enough of them, you're supposed to be happy. You're supposed to be able to go, okay, thank you. I made it. I, I have arrived. And, and all of us have been through that where we've sought after things in this world. And then after we, we got them, we achieved them, we accumulated them, even after we seem to possess them, you know, we, we started to say, is this some kind of a joke? Because I'm still not fully satisfied. I'm not fully content. I'm not fully happy and joyful with things and stuff. And this is because we have been looking in the wrong direction. We've been looking to the world of form. We've been scouring the projection to try to find what it is that will bring the happiness and it can't be found in the projection. The projection, actually Jesus says projection is the attempt to get rid of something that you do not want. And that's why people blame the world, blame people, blame the environment, uh, they point the finger at the world because they feel lacking within, they feel unfulfilled, and then they're gonna use the, the world as a scapegoat. Oh, if I had, if this was different, or if I had more of this, or if this hadn't happened to me when I was five years old, then I would be in good condition. It's just a big, big game. So, 
One thing I, I did go down to the questions. I noticed uh, Esther had uh, also uh, written in a, an interesting question, and and this question was partly related to another part of the the text of A Course in Miracles. Actually, it was going all the way back to chapter six, the lessons of love, and she was going through the lessons of the Holy Spirit. A lot of you are very familiar with that section of the Course and the three lessons of the Holy Spirit. And basically, Esther was saying that um, she's read the first three parts of this section and she finds that it's another pivotal place for me to grow into the light and love. And she was asking for a little bit of clarification on on those three lessons of the Holy Spirit and uh, also wanting if, if there was a way to connect them to uh, to incorporate them with chapter 30, the rules of decision. And so basically, I think I can make a few comments about those three lessons of the Holy Spirit because I've done a lot of uh, teaching on these three lessons over over the years, but I think they do relate to what we're talking about. They do relate very directly to the new beginning. First of all, aren't you happy that there's only three lessons? I mean, ultimately we know there's really only one lesson, but if, you, if I'm glad there's not 10 lessons of the Holy Spirit or 20 or 50 lessons of the Holy Spirit. For me, when I first read this in the course, I went, Hallelujah, three lessons, that's fantastic. Bring it on, I, that's really a nice number. That's the same number as the Trinity. I, please uh, enlighten me on what those lessons are. If I've only got to learn three lessons, then let's, let's get moving here. I, the course is a big book, but three lessons, I should be able to handle that. I figured my mind should be able to handle three lessons. And, uh, and he said in the course, he said, actually, it's only the, the first lesson that, that you do by yourself. Uh, it's like as soon as you really get through lesson number one, you are joined so deeply by, uh, by help, by, by the Holy Spirit, by uh, Mighty Companions, once you get past that first lesson, which will be the most difficult one, that's where you experience the most conflict and attack and, and uh, difficulty. But once you get through lesson one, then it's like downhill from there. So I was very encouraged that there's only three lessons and I really have to get uh, over the hump with number one. And then I can cruise into <laughs> two and three with lots of help. Uh, from the Holy Spirit. That was very encouraging to me as well. So the first lesson of the Holy Spirit, and this also deals with sp specifics, uh, because that's when the mind's stuck and believing time and space, it's, it's going to have to, to uh, loosen itself from that, uh, that addiction to the specifics. And the very first lesson of the Holy Spirit is to have, give all to all. To have, give all to all. And he's telling us right away, he said, this is going to be the toughest one uh, because it goes so against everything that you believe and everything that the ego believes. It's going to be a 360 turn on everything that you believe. And why is this so? Why is to have, give all to all so, um, so difficult? So difficult of a lesson to grasp. It's because the entire Big Bang, the entire cosmos, and everything in the fabric of everything in time and space is based on scarcity, it's based on lack, it's based on the belief in, that you're incomplete. And therefore, the ego has made up this whole montage of images for one reason, to promote the getting mechanism, 
The ego is the getting mechanism in the mind. I've got to get this, I've got to get that. It's, I want to do these things so I can get those things. I want to have a job to earn money so I can get other things for my body, for my personality self. And the entire cosmos is based on this getting mechanism. And so the first lesson of the Holy Spirit is to have, give all to all. And as you are beginning to get into the attitude of being generous, of being giving, of extending, of offering, of, of really, really starting to get into that giving state of mind, the ego is going to have fits. The ego is going to say, I told, I told you, don't, don't be too giving because you're going to pay a price. Uh, don't be too generous. <laughs> you know, generosity, it would say, has its limits. Uh, and don't be going and having a loving attitude with everyone. You're going to be in trouble if you go try to love everyone. You've got to have your boundaries. You've got to protect yourself. You've got to uh, keep a watch, keep an eye out for people. Uh, it takes different forms where people say, well, just be careful. You can't trust everybody. And, and you know, don't be too generous. Just don't be too generous because you're going to be sorry in the future because if you're too generous, you're going to give away all that you have and then there'll be nothing left for you. And you'll be broke and you'll be brokenhearted. And if you just give without being concerned of getting, then it's saying you're going to become destitute, you know, poor, alone. And, and so the Holy Spirit knows that, that actually that's not the way the universe works. That's not the way God's laws operate. But this first lesson to have, give all to all is actually a way to, to begin to unwind from the getting mechanism, from this belief that you have to keep getting and, and collecting and achieving and accumulating uh, and, and building. Uh, all these things are part of the human construct that are based in scarcity and lack. And scarcity and lack are not ideas that God even knows about. These are just purely ego ideas. And then the human being is just a, a mechanism that is a body, is something that the ego uses to get for itself. And, and yet nothing that you get in, in the name of the ego means anything. You can't take it with you. <laughs> it, whatever you get in this world, believe me, it's, it's, you can't carry it into eternity. <laughs> you, can't, you can't take anything of this world into eternity, into love and light. And so you can see that the very first lesson is basically saying, why don't you trust me? and just become really generous. Like really, when you're with somebody, give them your heart. Take time to fully be with them. If somebody's in need of something, give it to them. Uh, help people, always be in this extending, giving, helping state of mind. And why? Not because you get any brownie points for uh, giving away stuff, but actually your focus, the altar, of your mind, the altar of your heart, starts to shift away from incompletion and lack, and it starts to shift into a sense that you have an abundant storehouse of miracles within yourself that you can give away. And the more miracles you extend and give away, the more you're aware of them. They actually multiply as you give these miracles away. Or even better, as you let the Jesus and the Holy Spirit perform miracles through you, you're more aware of the miracles and you're also more aware of the love that you are because miracles are, are part of that extension of the love. So that's, for me, I mean, to give you a specific example, I was, you know, I was raised in a, 
kind of a, a Protestant uh, family. I, I believed in the Protestant work ethic and saving money and and save for a rainy day and lots of things. And also I had 10 years of, of university where I learned more about the intricacies of the laws of this world. It didn't really teach me much about the laws of heaven in uh, university, but I have to say that once I got into A Course in Miracles, then it was like Jesus was saying, okay, now we're gonna go in another direction. You're going to learn to trust me and I'm going to provide everything for you. I'm just going to knock your socks off. I'm going to blow your hair back. I'm going to blow your hat off with so many miracles that you're going to realize I'm taking care of you. Uh, your jobs aren't taking care of you. You know, earning money and all the things that you believe that in the world are taking care of you. They're not, it's just that you, you're hallucinating. You're you're off in some kind of crazy belief system that doesn't have anything to do with God. So I'm going to, I'm going to really blow your hair back. It was back in the day when I had a little hair. Uh, I'm going to blow your hair back and knock your socks off. And I'm going to convince you that you are safe. You are provided for, you are cared for, and you're going to be a miracle worker, not an urban planner. I have a degree in urban planning and <laughs> Uh, all these psychology credits. No, you're not going to be a psychologist. No, you're not going to be, you're going to be a miracle worker and I'm going to teach you through extending miracles how, how cared for you are, how safe you are, how completely provided for you are so that you will understand that, that you can give all to all and there's no sacrifice. When you give all to all, you'll realize you are blessing yourself, you are blessing the whole universe, and nobody's losing through your giving. Uh, I'm, I'll give you a storehouse of miracles and you just give them away. I'll direct you how, where, when, but, but I will provide for you the miracles that will change your mind about yourself and about everything. So that's, that's what to have give all to all is really about. And that's also what Esther, that's what the, the rules for decision are about. The, the rules for decision are about changing your mind from being ego dependent to being spirit dependent. That's really what the rules for decision are. They're just shifting your mind from those old past patterns of the ego and past learnings and beliefs to trust. Trust the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, Jesus, will provide everything that you seem to need in time and space. Without exception, it will be abundantly given. Now, the second lesson of the Holy Spirit is, is an, another process uh, lesson, which is to have peace, teach peace to learn it. And, and that lesson is a way of strengthening the peace in your mind by extending it. Once you get out of the getting mechanism, then you're not so concerned with the outcomes. Uh, if, if you're in business in a worldly sense, or if you're in a profession, basically, if you have a career, you've got to get the job done. You don't get paid unless you get the job done. Uh, you, don't, you don't get the money unless you do what's required to get the money. With Jesus, you want to experience the miracle. Jesus says, I will do the miracle through you if you'll just let me. And so basically, all you're responsible for is getting out of the way. Uh, that's all you have to do if, to be a miracle worker is just to get out of the way, to just be willing to be used by the Holy Spirit and then to get out of the way, not try to throw up resistance and fear and put the brakes on it all just to say, use me. And I'm going to, I, I voluntarily allow you to use my mind to extend miracles and use my body, use my bank account, use, use everything, use any skill and ability I seem to have developed in an ego framework. Now it's yours 
And I'm just going to get out of the way and behold the miracle as it comes through me. And that takes practice. I mean, it took me, I was a slow learner, but it took me some years of practice uh, at the beginning years of studying the course. It took me four or five years of, um, of slowly starting to put this into practice in my daily life. And then um, after five years, Jesus, I think Jesus finally is like, come on, let's take the training wheels off now. And uh, we're going on a road trip. And I went on like a five-year road trip with Jesus all across the United States where he said, I'll provide everything for you. You just be there for me and follow me, and I'll provide absolutely everything for you. You don't have to worry about a single thing. And, and that, yeah, that was from like 1991 to 1996. That was extremely helpful at uh, really transcending the fear and, and getting into to have, give all to all. I was just learning how to be a giver at that stage. The second lesson, to have peace, teach peace, to learn it, goes in conjunction with the first one because as soon as you get out of this getting mechanism, you're just showing up to, to be used and to extend peace of mind. It, whether you're at the grocery store or the laundromat, a course group, whether you're talking to a neighbor, you start to realize that you're just here to teach peace. And I mean, not teach it verbally. I didn't go out, walk door to door to my neighbors and say, would you like to learn about peace? You know, <laughs> it's not like that at all. It's your attitude. Your attitude is the teacher of the peace. And people start to notice that you're not getting upset. You're just smiling a lot. You're laughing a lot. You're very happy, go lucky, you're lighthearted. I was teaching with my attitude. And, and wherever I would go, it didn't matter who I encountered, in what uh, circumstances, what country, doesn't, doesn't matter. It was like I was given lots of opportunities, you know, to have peace, teach peace, to learn it. And then the last lesson, Esther, that, that is in that, those three lessons is basically be vigilant, only for God and his kingdom. There's that vigilant word. This actually relates to the first question I, I answered with Adriano, which was basically about asking me to talk about um, fidelity. And I was talking, answering that question, um, I was talking about commitment. And commitment ultimately has to be aimed at your mind training, at your discipline of, of purification in your mind, your consciousness. So that last one is be vigilant only for God and his kingdom. And basically what that's saying is you have to really go for it in the fullest way. Whatever stepping stone lessons you've had along the way, you're going for a place where you completely withdraw your attention from looking for fulfillment through anything of this world. That's basically, you're gonna go cold turkey on the world of images uh, eventually. You know how people talk about going cold turkey with, with becoming celibate or cold turkey and they're gonna fast for a month or you know they, they're gonna, they're not going to swear. Maybe they have, they're used to a lot of profanities. I'm, I'm not going to swear. I'm not going to use any profanities. I'm going cold turkey on that. It's, it's ultimately all that stuff is just part of the context of going to start to realize that I need to go inward to my purpose and a sustained, stable, single purpose will show me God's real world, will show me the happy dream. It will show me everything all the same, where I can look upon the world with no judgment whatsoever, not the slightest judgment or thought about anything in the world, because forgiveness is my only purpose. That's the one purpose, that's the one interpretation that, that heals the whole perceptual world. 
And that's why there's no order of difficulty in miracles and there's no hierarchy of illusions. It's because forgiveness shows, shows you the world anew and that is the new beginning. The new beginning is seeing the world anew. It's not a, a new beginning in terms of time. It's, it's seeing the whole world anew. And the only way that you reach that is there, that third lesson of the Holy Spirit is, is be vigilant only for God and his kingdom. And in that lesson, you have an amazing revelation. And I, I kind of, sometimes I call it, the, some of you remember the cartoon Popeye? Does anybody remember Popeye the spinach? the guy with the spinach and olive oil. And Popeye sometimes would say, I am what I am, and that's all that I am. Uh, that was Popeye. I am, that I, I am what I am, and that's all that I am. The final realization that you get from being vigilant only for God and his kingdom is the realization that what I am and what I have are the same. What I have is what I am. You see how different that is from the world. Do you have a bank account? Do you have a wife or a husband? Do you have a child? Do you have a pet? Do you have a house? You know, do you have a country? Do you have a nationality or, or a, an ethnicity? Do you have a culture? No, 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 you don't really have any of those things because that's all the ego. That's all the make-believe stuff that the mind has become attached to and identified with, but it's not real, none of it is real. Having and being are the same. What I have is what I am. So I have an identity and I am an identity, but this having has nothing to do with time and space. And therefore, it has nothing to do with getting, or accumulating, or achieving, or collecting. You can't have it in the bank, because what I have is what I am. And what I am doesn't involve a bank. What I am doesn't involve money. What I am doesn't involve houses. What I am doesn't involve bodies. What I am doesn't involve anything of time and space. And that's when you truly know true abundance, not manifesting more stuff like the secret or you know, some of these uh, manifestation things. You're not going to realize who you are by manifesting things and stuff because the things and stuff aren't you and never were you, never will be you. You are entitled to know who you are. That the, the Greeks said, know thyself. That was the whole teaching right there. All you, you're doing is knowing that who you truly are is spirit. And that you, you have spirit, you are spirit. And what I have is what I am. Now, how does that relate to the new beginning? Well, that's, that's definitely a good inroads to the new beginning right there. Uh, that's, that's the third and final lesson of the Holy Spirit. It, it doesn't go any higher than that. Uh, when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, Some, no one comes to the Father but through me, he was just simply stating, I am. You know, he could have stopped it right there even. Instead of, I am the way, the truth, and the life, he could have just said, I am. <laughs> you know, that would have covered it right there. And this relates directly to our section, The New Beginning. Oh, I'm borrowing a Suave's book. Look who I found in there. <laughs> Ah, those eyes have something to tell us today. And when I went to the, the new beginning, I know Ricky, I know you and uh, Jenny started off by reading from the new beginning. And 
when I went through the chapter 30, you know, I, you know, how certain parts really speak to you. I have to say, for all these years of working with the Course, since 1986, there's, there's actually one section in this chapter that always jumps out at me. It just always hits me between the eyes. And, and I always end up with the biggest smile on my face when I go through this section, no matter when I pop open the book. <clears throat> it's always there. And I think it's, uh, I don't know, <clears throat> Jesus comes zooming in with those eyes and he's just like saying, you know, here, I have it for you. Please pay attention <laughs> to my words. So this section, I'm just going to go through it briefly for you because I love it so much. I love it with all my heart. But this section is from chapter 30, The New Beginning, and it's number three. It's called Beyond All Idols. Some of you probably know that. I just get the biggest smile on my face uh, when, I, when I look at this book and see Beyond All Idols. I don't know why. Um, maybe it was because I was raised with the Bible uh, when I went to Bible studies and Bible school and when I was little. And I do, there's a lot of stuff I forgot about the Bible. I forgot, a, I forgot most of it. But actually, uh, one thing I did remember from the Bible was this, uh, this uh, commandment that you shall hold no idols before the Lord thy God. I remembered that. I remembered that from my early Bible studies. You shall hold no idols before the Lord thy God. And I remember as a child, I, I used to ask people, what are, what are idols? What are idols? And they say, well, you know, you shouldn't be worshiping uh, any totem poles uh, or golden statues, you know, people would tell me, uh, I better stay away from the gold statues, you know, just, you shouldn't be, you shouldn't be worshiping things. Uh, and I thought they meant um, like, like images, uh, you know, deities or whatever. Because I had heard there were other religions and they worshiped a lot of different things and, and they, so that's what I was basically told. But I, I really didn't know the extent of what that meant, of hold no idols before the Lord thy God. I really, I didn't really understand the full impact of what this was saying. So here's what he has to say. Idols are quite specific. That's what we've been talking about here. We're addicted to specifics, and so idols are quite specific. And uh, Jesus gives us good definitions, you know, and I would have helped me a couple years ago if I'd heard that in Bible school, but idols are quite specific. But your will is universal, being limitless. And so it has no form, nor is content for its expression in the terms of form. That's important. Um, your will is universal, being limitless. So when someone tells you, well, that, that person died, it was God's will, or that country got slaughtered, that, well, it must have been part of God's will. No, actually, God's will is universal, and our will, which is one with God's, is also universal. It's, it cannot be contained in form in scenarios, in dreams. It's the dreams of specifics that cover over our will. So you might say that if you're asleep and dreaming in this world, all that's happened is you've forgotten your true will. Because your will and God's will are the same, but if you forget that, then you think you have a will of your own. And you think you have willpower, and you're, you have a will to be able to make things happen and make your world be the way you want to be, that's not truly God's will and that's not your will. God's will for us is perfect happiness. Idols are limits. 
They are the belief that there are forms that will bring happiness and that by limiting is all attained. So there's the key right there, the belief that forms will bring, there are forms that will bring happiness. There are things, there are people, there are situations, there are scenarios. There's this crazy belief that somehow if we go along enough in this dream world that one day we're going to reach a point where we're just going to look around and go, ah, I have all the right forms. I have enough of all the right forms. But there aren't any right forms and there isn't, an, there isn't such a thing as enough. You know, uh, the only enough that there is is when you start to realize that, that, that there is no form that will bring happiness. And then your mind can rest at that point, but that's the new beginning. That's what we're talking about. That's a whole new beginning. It is as if you said, I have no need of everything. This little thing I want, and it will be as everything to me. And this must fail to satisfy, because it is your will that everything be yours. Decide for idols, and you ask for loss. Decide for truth, and everything is yours. So it's... What we're talking about is you have to come to that place where you actually have a realization that what I have is what I am. I will never have more than what I am. I will never have less than what I am because what I have is what I am. Where it's washing away all ego connotations of having. So as if you've never heard the word before, as if you're, you're completely free of this idea of having, because we've been conditioned and we've been programmed to believe that in order to have, you have to get. You must get in order to have, says the ego. Says the Holy Spirit, what I have is what I am. You see the difference there? There's no getting. You don't have to get anything to be who you already are. Because there's no incompletion, therefore you don't have to seek and try to attain and try to capture or possess anything. You can truly let go and expect a, a miracle of, have, of God to show you that you, you have everything. You, always have had everything. There's nothing that is missing. There's nothing that's lacking. It is not form you seek. What form can be a substitute for God the Father's love? What form can take the place of all the love in the divinity of God the Son? And what idol can make two of what is one? Can, and can the limitless, limitless be limited? You do not want an idol. It is not your will to have one. It will not bestow on you the gift you seek. And some of you have listened to me for years. The next line, I have said this line countless times. I, I said this line back in the 80s, back in the 90s, 2000s, now here we are, 2018. David is still saying the same line. I don't know why he likes this line so much, but somehow he must believe it's important because he never shuts up about this next sentence. He's still, he probably needs to go into divine silence, but this might be the last words on his lips before he finally closes that mouth for good. And here's the sentence. When you decide upon the form of what you want, you lose the understanding of its purpose. I'll say it one more time. When you decide upon the form of what you want, you lose 
the understanding of its purpose. So it's like, imagine that you were watching like an eclipse and as you're watching the eclipse, it's coming closer and closer and then what's in front is the form and what's behind is, is the purpose. And when you decide upon the form of what you want, when you really let that come in front, if you put your focus and attention on the form, oh, I can't wait for a sunny day. Oh, I can't wait to have a million dollars. Oh, I can't wait to have a beautiful soulmate who looks like this. I can't wait to retire and have a big nest egg so I can just sit there and sip lemonade with the cherry in all day. I can't wait. Whatever the form is that you decide what you want, it will obscure the purpose of forgiveness because the form is the idol. And the form has to be forgiven. The, the whole purpose of the Course is to help you forgive what you perceive. That's why lesson number one in the workbook is nothing I see means anything. You see, Jesus is going right at forgiveness from the, from the very beginning, from the very first lesson. He is starting off with the key idea that you have to forgive what you perceive. And the more you do those workbook lessons, the more he's going to show you that your fulfillment your joy, your happiness comes from your purpose and from your function and it doesn't come from forms. It doesn't come from any forms in this world. It's, it's what Stephanie was writing in her, her message, you know, you were, you were listing all the things that you had sought for fulfillment and happiness and those, it's getting intense now because those things are, are drifting. You're, they're pulling back, and it's because you're determined to find peace of mind. You're determined to find true happiness. It's the purpose for which you came, is to discover this purpose. Yeah, maybe it's like a needle in a haystack, but it's there. It's, it's there for sure, and you're going to find it because it's that important to you. And that's what this is saying here, is when you decide upon the form of what you want, you lose the understanding of its purpose. This is why manifesting in the end doesn't work because when you are trying to manifest something into form, you're still chasing idols. Even, even using the power of the mind to manifest, it, it can be a stepping stone. It can show you how powerful your mind is, that's for sure. It can be very helpful, but ultimately it won't work because you're still trying to find something in form. You're still trying to find something that will give you more, give you more security, more happiness, more contentment. It won't work. And this is why. It's because, so you see your will within the idol. Remember we just read in the first sentence, second sentence, your will is universal, being limitless. And now he's telling us when you decide upon the form of what you want, you lose the understanding of the purpose because so you see your will within the idol, thus reducing it to a specific form. Yet this could never be your will because what shares in all creation cannot be content with small ideas and little things. Why would you ask for such a tiny little thing in all the universe when you're entitled to know who you are, to know yourself as a creation of God, and to know that you, that's a stylistic song, you are everything, and everything is you, oh, you are everything, and everything is you. There we go, stylistic singing the, the law of God. And this is saying, don't be content with little things because who you are is so magnificent, so spectacular, 
that it's not your will to be content with little things, little ideas and things. Behind the search for every idol lies the yearning for completion. Wholeness has no form because it is unlimited. To seek a special person or thing to add to you, to make yourself complete, can only mean that you believe some form is missing. He's getting pretty specific there, to seek a special person or thing to add to you to make yourself complete can only mean that you believe some form is missing. And by finding this, you will achieve completion in a form you like. This is the purpose of an idol, that you will not look beyond it to the source of the belief that you are incomplete. So now we're dispelling, we're dispelling the ego's guilt, we're dispelling sin, we're dispelling fear, we're dispelling all forms of conflict and limitation when we start to realize that it's just by using our powerful mind to search for little things that we keep ourselves lack lacking, we, keep, we hold ourselves back. And when we release the search, we come into the contentment of knowing our true will as the will of God for just happiness, just for the state of pure happiness. Not a happiness that's supported by things, or uh, I need this to be happy, I need five more of these to be happy, you know, crazy ideas. Sometimes I hear sports, sports heroes and they, they win like uh, four major events and then they'll say, I really, I'm, gonna, I'm on my quest for my fifth because I need, I need five to be truly happy. It's like it, it just never ends. <laughs> then you get five and what, you're still gonna go for six, you know, it just, it, the ego is so tricky. It, it never stops, it's never enough. Now there's also a line in the Beyond All Idols section that um, I really like. In paragraph four and in sentence five is a very short sentence, but I'm going to read you this sentence. And this is kind of a, an important sentence metaphysically because you'll hear people say all kinds of things about God and God creating this world and, you know, and it's only the evil and the conflict that's the problem. Actually, here's a beautiful sentence from paragraph four, sentence five. It's only got four words. God knows not form. That's pretty strong. God knows not form. God, being love, knows love. Wholeness, spirit, completion, totality, and form is a projection of the ego. The ego made this world. God didn't create this world. It was the ego that made this world. And God knows not form. If God knows not form, then God knows not the body. God knows not Earth. God knows not Mars or Pluto or Saturn. God knows not Big Bang. God, God knows not male. God knows not female. God knows not form, meaning spirit doesn't know about form. It's the sleeping mind and the ego that have invented the Big Bang and this imaginary hallucination of time and space to keep from being happy, to keep from being joyful, to keep from knowing oneness eternity, infinity. <laughs> this world of form is like a, a veil drawn over the truth. It's like a, it's like a thick cloud pattern. It's, it's like a mirage of images that were made to cover over and keep the Christ blinded to the Christ. It's to keep the Christ from knowing Christ as Christ. It's a substitute reality that isn't real at all. It's, it's like a, 
It's like a holodeck. If you use Star Trek terms, it's one heck of a holodeck. Uh, but it's meant to distract you from stillness, it's from, from knowing yourself as abstract love and light. So to me, that's a key uh, sentence. God knows not form. He cannot answer you in terms that have no meaning. And your will could not be satisfied with empty forms made but to fill a gap that is not there. It is not this you want. Creation gives no separate person and no separate thing the power to complete the Son of God. So what this section is doing is it's explaining specialness. It's explaining that as long as the mind tries to focus in on specific forms as the good things, the valuable things, and then has other forms that are the bad things, the negative things, the avoidable things, the, the things that are despicable, whatever it wants to call them, it just cleaves the world into duality, the good and the bad, the right and the wrong, the moral and the immoral, it just divides the world into categories. And some of those categories it will tell you to pursue, and some of those categories it will tell you to avoid. And that is the game of this world. That's the game of many theologies and many religions. Here's the good things, here's the bad things. Do the good things, go to heaven. Do the bad things, burn in hell. <laughs> you know, whoo, scary, scary, scary. That's pretty scary, the burn in hell part. And it's all made up. There, there aren't really good things and bad things. It's just the purpose in your mind that, that determines what you perceive, perceive. And if you forgive, you you start to see there's no hierarchy of illusions, there's no order of difficulties. One illusion is the same as all the rest. And you're not drawn to them. Why would you go for an illusion instead of the truth of who you are? You simply are not going to be drawn to distractions, delay maneuvers, all of these roads of the world that lead nowhere. There comes a point where you say, I'm just not into that. Now, let's talk about this in practical terms a little bit, because I think I always want to bring it back to the practical. Because for me, when I read the Course, to me this was not some kind of intellectual endeavor. This was not some kind of a book of theology that I could go around. I didn't want to become a, a Course thumper, like a Bible thumper, going around thumping, thumping people on the head with the Course. That didn't sound very appealing to me. Uh, to me, I thought, he must be talking about something really important here, and he's talking about the freedom of my mind. He's talking about free, freedom of my will, not, not free will to choose anything I want in the world, but I mean free will in terms of knowing my will and God's will are in alignment. And I thought, that is no small thing. This is huge. Now, I just have to practice it. I just have to put it to practice to really have the experience of it. That's all I really have to do is find a way to just dive into it. And, and what that has done over the years is that your trust that everything is perfectly taken care of grows stronger and stronger and stronger. Uh, when, you're, when you even seem to be like traveling, like I'm over here in Portugal now, but I'm not really looking for anything. You know, I'm not like, I'm not on like a little scavenger's hunt looking around trying to find something in the world. I'm enjoying the, all the holy encounters with the, the birds and the flowers and the people and the trees and bushes. I mean, but it's, it's a state of of you're just beholding and you're giving and you're extending and it's so natural, but I'm not really looking to find anything. And when you're not looking to find anything in the world, you'll never be disappointed. 
But if you're looking to find something in the world, you're always going to be disappointed. Something's always going to be disagreeable to the ego. It's going to say, oh, you can do better than that, or you need to move to another place, or find another person, or find another situation. It just goes on and on. The ego, it, it has an insatiable quench, uh, insatiable thirst, actually, for, for nothing. <laughs> and it's always trying to tempt you to pursue nothing. And then as soon as you find that nothing, you go, what's this? And it says, oh, what about over there? <laughs> it's, it just diverts your attention to go on another uh, pursuit or goose chase. And that's what my life is about, and that's what we're doing in these online retreats, is to help strengthen this awareness that we don't need to search outside of our mind to find the truth or to find who we are. We're strengthening the, the belief that, that forgiveness is, is an inside job. It's totally within your mind. It doesn't have anything to do with externals. No matter what those externals are, it doesn't really matter. It's, it's a state of mind that you can accept at any moment without having to go chase down more stories, more people, more scenarios, more dreams, more situations. To me, this is, this is the good news. This is the new beginning. It's a, it's a new way of looking upon the world with a st sense of, of calm and peace and stillness and without the sense of like a drive to make something different, to, to change something. Can you imagine how peaceful that is when you can just sit down and watch the nightly news on a television with a big smile on your face, knowing that it's all just a reflection of your forgiven mind. That's what the news is, <laughs> a reflection of your forgiven mind. It's possible to view it that way. It's actually possible to see, see it completely without any kind of charge or judgment. But that requires discipline. It requires mind training. It requires you just to, to hone in on that deep desire you have for peace, of mind and to say I'm worth it. I, I desire a peaceful state of mind. I desire a peaceful perception of the world more than anything else, more than any outcomes of the world. I desire that peace of mind. So while we have some time here, Jeff, why don't we open it up to all these beautiful participants all over the world that I see, and let's just uh, open the floor up to go into some of these ideas that pertain to this new beginning that we're talking about, this new beginning of looking at the world entirely differently. Sounds great. <clears throat> I see Esther's hand is up. Go ahead, Esther. This is just what I was looking for. I've been on this search um, since a, I was a little girl, for God, and um, look for it outside myself, in like in a gust of wind or 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 um, something happening that's for you know seemed like it was just made for me, you know. And and now this psychiatrist search that I'm involved in, I realize that I'm not looking for. Uh, something special in the psychiatrist to be changed that he's not going to say certain things to me like others have or anything like that I realized that um, That's just a distraction uh, From me focusing on peace of mind as my purpose and uh, with Jeff's help um, on the mighty companions I've been able to work with him and realize that um, What is my purpose? I asked him one time and he said well, why don't you sit into prayer and 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 discover and I uh, still not sure what that is for me but when he said his own he, uh, healing of the mind I realized that resonated with me and I can work with that it's very a solid experience 
uh, desire, um, something I can relate to. And so now when, um, uh, so thank you for all this explanation, David. Um, and it's, it, it's, it's going to be here for, for a long time for me to listen and re-listen. And, um, now I can help my friend Alan also when he needs the support because, um, he has issues too and not clear about guidance, what it means and all that. And now I, I see that even that may not be as important as holding that purpose um, and knowing what's, what's the distractions to look for, um, be more clear on that. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you, Esther. Thank you. Beautiful. Okay, I notice that Miss Teresa has her hand up. Go ahead, Miss Teresa. Hello, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, I love smoking cigarettes and drinking coffee, and I've not been eating well. And I realized that, like, at first I felt guilty, and I wasn't feeling guilty for the reason I thought. I thought I was feeling guilty because I'm treating my body so badly. No, I and feel guilty because I think I'm a body and I think that these things can somehow help me or whatever. Um, so I guess what you're saying is maybe every time I want to smoke a cigarette, I should realize I'm making it an idol. But then I also remember when I was a clean liver, I was a vegan. I never had any caffeine and that to me was, I made that an idol. So I'm just kind of wondering, um, how to go about this and look at this in a different way. Thank you. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, you know, it's like Jesus said a couple thousand years ago, it's, it's not what, def what you put in your mouth that defiles, it's, it's, uh, it's what proceeds forth from the heart. So uh, one of the, whenever you start to be concerned about about smoking or caffeine or all those kind of things that you mentioned because it can it can go in different patterns you can be vegan and then you're concerned about finding a piece of meat in your food or you know there's always a concern basically I, I like the workbook lesson I can be hurt by nothing but my thoughts because what it does is it sends you back into your mind and the mind is extremely powerful, and, and he says, I have no neutral thoughts, I see no neutral things. The mind is so powerful that when we hold on to uh, thoughts of this world, that's what generates the guilt. And then the, the ego will provide all kinds of escapisms, distractions, diversions, addictions, it will just go on and on and on to try to substitute for that, that guilt feeling, but it's, it, it doesn't work out. It's almost like uh, just taking one illusion for another and then shifting around to different illusions. It doesn't really bring any kind of uh, peace or satisfaction. But as you start to get in touch with your feelings, that's good. When you get in touch with your thoughts and are starting to be more aware of your thoughts, that's, that's good. That's very healthy. I've even got a, sec, a, a website called levelsofmind.com, and, and I help people uh, go inward uh, through the level of perception and then through the level of um, emotions and feelings and then down to the cognition or thought level, then to the belief and then down to the desire, the core, the altar in the mind. And, and our whole spirit, uh, which is our automated uh, Facebook uh, spirit, uh, your spirit assistant is, is a way of kind of doing that in kind of an automated way of going deeper into the mind. So when you feel, when you're, when you're smoking or having coffee or doing things that a lot of human beings do, if, if it's coming from a sense of a craving, of a need, of a lack, it's because of the, the belief in lack and the, the belief in need that is being generated deep in consciousness. And so when you start to do the work with the Course, it's, it starts to take the, 
the focus off of the forms. Uh, I remember going to, um, in the early uh, 1990s, like around 1990, 1991, I went to the Foundation for A Course in Miracles up in Roscoe, New York, and my friend worked there, and, uh, um, you know, she would prepare the, the meals, and she worked in the kitchen, and then she would put them out, and she, they would make even, like, vegetarian portions, and in other portions and so forth. But as people would go through, they would look at her and say, too salty, uh, needs more salt, uh, too hot, too cold. You know, she would just watch the parade of, of thoughts all projected onto the food. And she was practicing A Course in Miracles, which is learning to just watch these thoughts. And I think that's, that's really the way to go about it. Uh, Teresa, it's, it, it's like when you are able to start to notice and be aware of the thoughts and then you start to go inward a little bit and you start to get in touch with that belief in lack, that's going to take you very quickly down towards what I call the new beginning, the, the new way of looking at the world because it's, it's bringing it into your mind and instead of the focus on the forms, it's taking you inside the mind, inside consciousness, to be shown, to actually learn how to, to align with the Holy Spirit, get deeper into your purpose and your function, and then the more you get into that function and purpose, the feelings of lack, the feelings of need go away. Uh, in, at first, they're, meet, they're met by the Holy Spirit in very miraculous ways, things coming at you left and right, but not of your own pursuit, but more just like given uh, to help you. And then they start to fade away. My, you know, my appetite is just, uh, I used to really enjoy Holy Encounters and having like three meals a day. And I just, the appetites just start to fade and fade away. So they just start just to disappear because the, the, the belief and the need for them uh, and the belief in lack is is getting washed away. I, I would say like with a fire hose, it's getting washed away with, with the Holy Spirit. So I hope that gives you a little bit of a context for this. Thank you, David. I'm just grateful to be here with everyone. Um, my question is, yes, like the practical application of rules of decision and getting into guidance and obviously that's very very important and so for a time it was like even coming into community it's trusting my brothers and the spirit in my brothers and the messages um coming through my brothers and um as i'm sort of lately being presented with options like or in invitations kind of like yes man it's like oh do i do i go for that or because I want to know the guidance, I'm kind of not, I'm sort of indifferent to doing it or not doing it. It's more my heart is in prayer of, is it something you're guiding me towards, Holy Spirit? Because I'm interested in the unwinding. <laughs> and I was recently guided to, or mentored to, like, like it says in the Course, nothing you need to know will not be given you, or He will tell you. And... So for me, I've been guided to like hear it within myself because I've been sort of leaning on and trusting my brothers and sort of, you know, looking for that direction externally. I've been guided to wait and learn to hear it for myself through my own channel. And what would your, your advice be on that aspect of like following the guidance and the nuances of like discernment or do I sit and wait because it was brought up yesterday to just go for it like don't sit around <laughs> and you know so do I hold steady and wait because then there comes a point where I'm like okay like not hearing anything like what you know what do I do there's a bit of impatience with that as well um and sincerely I just want to know sincerely I want to follow and so what's better I guess would it be just to sort of jump in and say yes and then see and find out or hold steady and wait to hear it within myself 
Um, I could be blocked or I don't know. I just, I'm kind of, this is on my mind lately because I truly want to follow. Yeah. Well, it's beautiful, Helena, that you're asking that because it was like I was up early this morning, about 4.30 in the morning, and I got this text message and uh, it was from Kirsten. And she was like, you know, can you talk? I'm, I'm at dinner. Can you talk in in uh, 20 minutes? And she was on the opposite side of the world. She was actually over at, in uh, New Zealand. and uh, But she had just come through... Uh, a lot of gatherings and retreats over there in Japan. And some of you know the Japanese culture, it can be kind of very reserved and, and quite shy, um, uh, very, very gentle, uh, but, the, but the mask um, can be pretty heavy uh, as far as trying to be polite all the time, you know, not to never be angry. You know, it's like you'd be quiet, you'd be gentle, and and so she she mentioned this man who was who was there who came to the retreats and I recognized his name because when Francis and I went over there some years ago I remember him he's very very devoted but what she said about him was is that he was really trying to do this awakening by himself um, you know he's he was doing all kinds of things I, to to really pushing pretty hard, like really, really, I want this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to wake up. And it reminded me a little bit of that uh, part in the Course where it says, you cannot wake yourself, uh, Jesus says, but you can allow yourself to be awakened. And that's very powerful, I can allow myself to be awakened. And so this man, uh, there were some other people that were there trying to help out with tech and do all these things, but they started to burn out in translations and there were people trying to be helpful. And then finally they asked this man, could you help? And as soon as he jumped in to start to help with the camera or the sound or help out in any way, as soon as he jumped in, he had a huge insight. And that huge insight was, oh my God, I've been trying to do this myself. And it's so hard. It's so hard. And I remember him. He, I just held, he was just wanting, and a lot of the Japanese were so much wanting, wanting, wanting to go on this journey to enlightenment, but it seemed so hard. And of course, as you know, Helena, the, the, there's the cracking open phase where where you just have to allow all the emotions up, and that's a huge part of it right there. I think when Francis and I were there, they were, we were a little bit like pop, Course in Miracles pop icons. <laughs> you know, we had, we had uh, what do they call it, groupies. <laughs> we were in Tokyo, and we were walking down the street, and, and these two women came running up to us like we were John and Yoko or something, you know, it was surreal. But I think we were like Course Miracles, like pop icons over there. And they were very polite and, and they were terrified. They, they told Kirsten they were terrified. They were just terrified of the love. Um, they were in a very strong resistance. When this man jumped in and started joining in and helping, um, he had this huge insight, like, oh my God, because he relaxed. And there's something amazing about the idea that relationships, our relationships with our brothers and sisters can be used in such a holy way that we have the experience that we're not alone or that we're not, we don't have to do it ourselves because it's that ourselves is the personality construct. And I think that sometimes gets, for this man, got in the way. You know, he was like, he was struggling with it and struggling. I remember myself, I remember that reading that line in the Course that miracles are collaborative. When I first read that, I was just like, wow. I never thought of miracles as collaborative. Uh, I thought of miracles like the Red Sea parting and raising the dead and, you know, feeding the, the multitudes. I mean, those are miracles to me that I read in the Bible, but I... I just never put that word collaborative 
together with miracles. You know, it just was like a stunning kind of thing. That's what I think this man discovered. He had this huge insight. So, I mean, I would say if, if, it, if you're presented with an opportunity where it feels like, hmm, that could bring some expansion, that's, well, that's out of the box, or that's uh, something I don't see every day, you know, those are kind of expansion opportunities. I think keep, keep your eye out for those. Another thing is um, just collaboration. I mean, I, uh, I was talking to Kirsten again today and she's, she's kind of been paired up uh, with this man, Clint, and, and both of them, I mean, things are unfolding, but they're getting used together in ways that he finds uh, it's, he never even believed that relationships could be used uh, for God in such a strong way. You know, he, he was sharing with me this morning from New Zealand, he's with her over there, and about his, his um, resistances. Um, like Kirsten's like, well, let's let pray together. Well, pray together. He was raised Mormon, but pray together, like join together around where to go, what to do, literally verbally pray together. Uh, you start to go through a day where you, you have this experience with somebody where you start to feel really joined and connected, but like you're both the same. There's someone pulling the string. There's someone using you in a way that's so helpful for everybody, for the, for the whole universe, and yet it's not, it's not seen in such an interpersonal way. Um, it's, it's a very different, expansive way of letting relationships be used uh, in a very holistic, I, I could say, kind of way. And, and he was telling me, he's, he was quite astonished. You know, he said, I, I, I was resisting, but we went down to New Zealand, I was thinking, okay, I'm going to take walks on my own, I'm going to, I'm just going to have some me time, I'm going to, you know, because of all this intensity that was there in Japan, and uh, one day where he decided he was just going to, I'm going out for a walk, I'm going to go on my own, okay, and then he went walking, and it was just like a downpour of rain just hit him, and he was shivering and he went back and he was all cold and shivering and and then Kirsten said what's going on and you know he was sharing some of his autonomous I'm me my time you know those kind of things and the spirit like almost chased him back and and oh wrap him up in warm towels and hold him and nurture him Kirsten was right there but it was it was again we're we're here to undo that sense of autonomy and we're to dive in with this sense of um, collaboration. And it's so beautiful too, because I know Clint is so, he's so open-hearted, he's so open-minded. I watch him, he just goes towards people, towards animals, towards, with such openness and love and such curiosity. And uh, Kirsten said to me, David, other than you, I have never met a person who like revels in holy encounters. He's like, everywhere he goes, it's all he's looking for. It doesn't matter whether it's her father, her brothers, the person on the street. He's just got this warm, radiant kind of love that wants to come out with everyone. And, and it was kind of striking for her that, that there he was traveling with her and, and he's so open. Because most people tend to be pretty closed off, you know. They've got their little zones, and they live inside of those zones. And they don't want to get too much connection and intimacy going <laughs> there. Maybe it's a feeling like that's going to bring too much drama, and I am not going to go down that drama road again. But I would say to pay attention to those kind of collaborative opportunities, uh, because they have enormous potential. Uh, once we start moving in that direction, we start to see the whole world differently. We start to see relationships differently. We start to feel like, really, use me, spirit. And, and I'm not going to push away my brothers and sisters, and I'm not going to 
throw up my boundaries and I'm not going to throw up my defense shields immediately when I'm around people. I'm actually going to let this warm, loving glow in my heart just come out through me with my brothers and sisters. And I think that's that will make it a lot easier. It's I, like you're going to turn a corner like the guy in Japan where you're just going to be smiling going, oh, I see Jesus. I see how it can be. It's, it's, it can be very inclusive and very collaborative. Uh, and it's, yeah, it makes all the difference. Thank you. Thank you, Helena. Okay, up next is uh, Heidi Peck. Go ahead, Heidi. Good morning, guys. Morning. So, um, are you guys getting an echo? Oh, there we go. Okay, um, so my question is, I have a problem with understanding true empathy as opposed to false empathy. Um, on the on the retreat last night, I got stuck on the response to Esther's question. And in the parable of Heidi, it just seems like I've had a lifetime of what is seemingly suffering. And so when I hear or perceive suffering outside of myself, I, I've got this big bleeding heart and I just want to comfort or like join in that. And I can see that it, that's, that's a false empathy, but I, I need a, an example or some clarity on how I can break this or come to a new beginning or new thought on false empathy as, as, uh, and true empathy, please. Yeah. Thank you, Heidi. That's, that's a really good question. Uh, it's interesting, as I've traveled around the world and I go meet a lot of people, I have found myself sometimes in 12-step groups and, and I watch them go around and introduce themselves. Hi, my name is so-and-so and I'm an alcoholic. And so I started practicing that at course groups. I would get the whole course group with the facilitator's permission uh, that they would go around and say, hi, my name is so-and-so and I have a perceptual problem uh, to, to start to lay it out. Because the first part of the course and the whole part of, of all spiritual authentic awakening pathways are, are just, it's huge, but, but the first realization that must dawn before there can be a change of purpose before there can be a true healing in the mind is, is the admission, just like an alcoholic is supposed to admit that their life is unmanageable and they need help from a higher power and they, they're, they find themselves uh, powerless to, uh, to find their healing is, is to first admit the problem. And so, when, like you say, if you feel like you, you perceive very sensitive to suffering and then perceiving suffering in others or outside of yourself, it's a bleeding heart kind of a, like your heart just wants to reach out like, oh, uh, but that's, it's more of, that's more pity. Uh, it's almost, almost taking pity on somebody in that way. And what I liked about the course was the more I read it and the more I, I worked up with it, I just was getting more and more convinced that, that this was a perceptual problem. Uh, first of all, Jesus was saying, he was using words like, you're hallucinating. And I had taken psychology courses, and I know what hallucinating is, or seeing like a mirage in the desert, but he's, he's saying that about the, the world. That he's saying it's a hallucination. Well, that a hallucination is, is basically seeing something that's not there. And, and I would ask Jesus, and he said, yeah, that's, you got that right. You're, you're, you're literally viewing something that's not even there. And that started to bring it home to me that I had a perceptual problem, <laughs> that, that I was, as I said, psychotic. I'd had a break from reality, a break from spirit. I was psychotic. I was schizophrenic. I was hearing multiple voices, the ego and the Holy Spirit, and that I had a hallucination. It 
issue going on too. I was seeing something that wasn't even there. And it also helped me when I read, and I think it's in the workbook, where Jesus says that pain is a false perception. That's an interesting definition uh, of pain, is a false perception. It's not, it's never true. In other words, it, it's always a false witness. And, and if I have a part of me that wants to reach out to that pain and say, oh, you poor baby, or, oh, that's terrible, you know, you are not alone in that many of us have, have grown up with, with, a, uh, with false empathy. Many of us have grown up commiserating. Many of us have grown up with uh, hearing gossip and jumping into the gossip. You know, you're describing a, a pathological mindset that is what the ego is. And so true empathy is quite simply staying with what is real and true. And when your mind's been addicted to upside down perception for maybe not just years or decades or centuries, but millennium, then this idea of true empathy, it starts to be difficult because it's kind of like, what does that even mean? You know, it's almost like asking a fish, what do you think of the beach? And the fish has been swimming in the ocean for 15 years. And what do you think of the beach? What's that? You know, I don't know what a beach is because it doesn't have a lot of experience. Maybe it flipped up on there once and it flipped around and got back in the water as quick as it could, but it, it, it doesn't have a lot of experience. So Jesus does say that true empathy is perhaps one of the hardest uh, things to grasp because there's so much conditioning based on thinking that there's an external world and that there are suffering things and bad things that are happening in that world. You know, that that's part of our mentality. Of course, we believe that. Like the fish, we only know a world where there's conflict and victims and victimizers and evil forces and judgments and stereotypes. And we've been so convinced that all of that is, is real that we need really deep mind training to unwind. And it took me a lot of practice. Uh, I mean, I have heard Course in Miracles students that have told me things like, oh yeah, I went to my uh, nephew's funeral and I was just laughing there and telling people that it's all an illusion. And I was like thinking, no, that's, you know, Jesus will show you the world differently, but, but Jesus will, will show you in an actual experience where you feel the connection and the love. That's what a funeral is about. It's actually about connection. It's about connecting with that deep love that's, be, that's underneath the grief. You're not there to tell anybody the world's not real or anything like that. You're there to, to connect. And yet I have found, as I've gone deeper with Jesus into the Course and deeper with the Spirit, that the Spirit is gentle, the Spirit is always loving, and the Spirit is always helpful in, in being appropriate. And uh, what I mean by appropriate is, is being truly helpful to everything and everyone. And that's where it, it does take a lot of mind training and practice, because that's part of true empathy too, is, is being so calm and so connected and so clear that you can offer a blessing wherever you go, including uh, situations where it seems like somebody's really in, in need. They're really praying to be shown the light. They're, be, they're praying to be shown the peace. And we shouldn't think, we shouldn't try to think the behavior is a certain way. Like when I went down to Argentina for the first time in 2003, there were children starving and their, the, the economy had just collapsed down there in Argentina. And there were kids on the street begging for food and doing acrobatics things and trying to bring home some coins for their parents. And I was aware of the whole situation. And so when I went there, my friend and I, we, we got lots of coins 
and she even got little angels and we met the people on the streets and we were giving giving them coins as guided and little angels and you should have seen the, the children's faces lighting up as I got an angel you know running off uh, sometimes they they like the angel better than the coin even but you you can be used in very graciously loving ways without perceiving the um, the the perception of suffering. In other words, you have a lot to offer, but clearing your mind of these misperceptions of suffering makes you more helpful to the world, to the to the universe, to the, to yourself. The clearer you become, and when you become clear, you become invulnerable, and you become uh, you have a clear, serene mind, and it's a very powerful mind, and that's how you extend the miracle. It's from that that place of clarity. So I would just hang in there with it because what you're describing is, is very common and most people who come to the Course are dealing with uh, that issue. And Jesus does say it's, it's quite, um, it can be quite difficult to be consistently uh, in true empathy because it's so alien to the ego mind. It's very alien to the ego. Thank you. Okay, we have one hand left, and we're about uh, nine minutes from the top of the hour, so it's perfect. Catherine, go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, great. Hi, David. Hey there. Hi. So I just, I, I'm really struggling with the concept of, um, a holy relationship, right? So I can't remember the exact wording, but what you, you've just read about um, idolatry is that even, you know, people, places, things, but especially people, thinking that someone else is going to bring something into, um, into the relationship that's going to help us heal. And then, you know, Jesus keeps talking about, you know, healing through relationships. So I feel like I have this fixation around wanting to find, you know, the holy relationship that's going to help me to um, show me everything that needs healing, you know. And in my mind, I really believe that it's an intimate relationship because um, partners um, or romantic partners seem to, to trigger all sorts of things that friends don't really do. So. You know, uh, I wonder if you could maybe just shed some light on that because it's like, yes, the letting go of everything, but it seems like the relationship is the stepping stone to help you to let go of everything. You know, so yeah. Yeah, I think there there are a couple aspects to that. I mean, certainly the one that you mentioned that uh, Jesus says, you, your brother is the mirror in which you see the perception of yourself as long as the perception lasts means that that in terms of the way the Course describes holy relationship and moving from special relationships to holy, that's, that's a major aspect of it is, is starting to watch your mind uh, in a closer way than you ever have because uh, particularly in what you're describing, there's so much mirroring that goes on. And the temptation is always to see it as outside or as the other, but we know from the Course that it's a, it's a mind thing that's happening there. Those are, those are just attack thoughts and judgments, preferences, all kinds of things getting flushed up into awareness. And that's, that is valuable in and of itself there. And then the other aspect of it is well, we talked, um, I know recently there was some talk of complementary ego dynamics in the sense Helen Shuckman and Bill Thedford had complementary ego dynamics that there are, are times, I think Ricky, you and uh, uh, Emily were both talking about uh, some complementary ego dynamics going on living there together at La Casa. But what that is, is is there are some, again, some hidden patterns that are so pushed out of awareness that 
that because the, the dynamics are so different that they really get exposed uh, in, in that context of being together. And then I would also say that there's a way that the Holy Spirit wants to use the relationships in a way that, that usually it's not seen at all, but um, it's a way that is seen from the higher perspective as truly helpful. Let me give you an example with, again, with Kirsten. So Kirsten's not been back to see her dad and her brothers for, uh, for years. And she flies down to New Zealand to meet them. And, and in her mind, it's, she's quite expanded and she's just there on her holy mission, uh, the same as she was in Japan, you know, just to see the Christ in everyone and, and bless. And, when, and Kirsten in Japan had a lot of wisdom pouring through her because the Japanese were like pulling it out of her, just like sponges, just loving it. But when she got down, you know, there's a line in the Bible, a prophet is never a prophet in their hometown. <laughs> you know, I remember that from the Bible. When Kirsten, in all of her wisdom, leaves Japan, goes down and she's with uh, Roger and, and Glenn and Gavin and everything, they don't want to hear it. You know, she may, she may just get a few words out and they change the subject, cut her off. You know, it's like a prophet is never a prophet in the hometown. Because they, just, they, they see, oh, my sister, oh, my daughter, you know, it's the filters are too thick. Just like Jesus had when he would, you know, go back to Nazareth or, you know, and, and they would say, you know, you know, people that knew him as a child and as a teenager were not buying the Messiah bit. You know, they, they thought, oh, boy, I, I know your mother. I watched you grow up from a baby and now you're the Messiah of the whole universe. Great get out of here, you know, because the, the past uh, is so thick. The ego learning is, the filters are too thick. But I mentioned Clint, here she goes down there with lovable Clint, who's like there, it's just such a loving guy. And, and he gets, he's all excited with all his healings he's having. And here they are, the brother and the, or his, her father was like listening, seeing this guy who's so happy and so grateful that he's been traveling with Kirsten and all the things that he's able to learn with Kirsten. And so he's sharing it all from his own experience of how wonderful this is. And, and that's another use of relationships. You see, it's almost like using Clint to open them up. And so much so as they open up more and more and more and more and get more relaxed and deeper down that uh, her father, who used to tell her, you know, why, why are you leaving New Zealand? You need to stay here, you need to come home, and all this and that. By the end, with Clint's support of coming in with the Holy Spirit through Clint, that her father was saying, you need to go back to Japan. Her father was saying, you need to keep traveling. There are so many people you are healing and helping. You see, it was through Clint that the Holy Spirit was able to reach in there and expand the perception when it couldn't always come through Kirsten because of the things. So that's a very high use. I would say if you're looking for like a, a holy relationship partner, uh, so to speak, I would say as you start to realize, oh, wow, I have a huge gift to give. I have a, a, my part to play in the plan of atonement. I want to heal and help everyone heal. And if the Holy Spirit and Jesus deem me fit to send in a partner or the, the one that could help me in a collaborative way to do my function, then you see how it's not so much Catherine seeking a partner is it's more I'm going to get into my function and then the spirit will bring in that which will collaborate with me and work with me and and make me more helpful and more expansive for the whole universe and the way that it worked for me is that I mean I, I think in the early years I pretty much was around Cincinnati and and uh, when I was going to Roscoe and some of these things, I, a lot of times it was just traveling solo. And then in 2003, 
I was guided to go down to Argentina. And then that began the world travels. Well, David doesn't speak other languages other than English. So with David going to all these other countries without speaking, like over here, I do meet people here in Portugal that are bilingual, trilingual, multi multilingual. All I spoke was English, but then when I would travel and land, I had different ones being sent in by Jesus that were my translators, that we did collaborations, and, and some of them, I mean, uh, Susanna Ortiz now from, uh, she flew all the way over from Spain to translate for me in uh, Colombia. She is an amazing course teacher now. She has people from all over the world that follow her, and it started with her traveling with me as a, uh, as, as a translator. Uh, where we both had our minds open because we were both used in such a deep way. I was letting the spirit pour through me. She was translating so fully and deeply into Spanish and then her mind expanded. And then um, years later when I met her, she had a, a center, our Nanshala center over there in, in the Canary Islands. And and then also had a center in Malaga. And when I went there, uh, she asked me to perform a wedding of two people that were getting married. And then this man came there and came to our gatherings and his name was Paco. And now Paco and Susanna are together. They, they are helping extend these great Course in Miracles and Curso de Milagros teachings all over the world He's very much helping her with the internet and tech support, and she's got these teachings and poetry pouring through her. So it's more of, like I was saying with Helena, it's more of a collaborative thing. It's not just the mirroring, it's, it's actually how can, can my skills and abilities be magnified and used in a, in a broader plan. And that's really, to me, that's the core of what holy relationship is. I've had amazing translators, I've had people who have traveled with me who added so much uh, to what I was sharing because they obviously could translate it to the people I was speaking to and they were absolutely essential to this expansive feeling. Without them it wouldn't have been the same at all. So I think that's, that's really what you're asking about is, is there has to be something even more than just the mirroring, and there really is. There's something even uh, deeper. See you shortly. Sav and I will see you very shortly. <laughs> okay. Well, Jeff, we've done it. <laughs> we, we're at the top of the hour here. <laughs> oh, beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah.